Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. I'm your host, Tanera Garvin. We're so excited that you've decided to join us this evening for Karis Daily Live Bible Study. I want to let you know that Karis Daily Live Bible Study is daily. You can join us Monday through Friday. And so we are Mondays and Fridays at 10 a.m., Wednesdays at 7 a.m., and then we're Tuesdays and Thursdays at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. So please join us when you can. Join us tomorrow, 10 a.m. Also, the Karis Daily Live Bible Study is an interactive Bible study. So we want to invite you to interact with us. So as you're hearing the message today and you recognize, man, that blessed me, or I have some questions on that, on the comment section underneath whatever platform you're watching, type in your questions and send them to us. We want to take the end of today's teaching to take time to hopefully get to answering your question. I also want to let you know that if you've been blessed by this ministry and you would like to give or to partner with us, you can do that at awmi.net slash give. You can also do that through our phone center and you can also call them. We have a 24 hour a day, seven day a week prayer ministry line that you can call and get prayer at any time. Midnight on a Sunday, we're open for you. And you can do that at 719-635-1111. Well, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce you our speaker today. He is the pastor of River Rock Church in Colorado Springs. He's also one of our main instructors at Karis Bible College. And so please welcome with me Pastor Rick McFarland. Thank you for joining oh, us. Absolutely. It's always a pleasure to be here. And so I want to talk about something that I've never really uh, did a whole message on. I think it's so important. And so I want to talk about women in ministry. Can women be in the ministry? I want to say the ministry, the pulpit ministries, the teaching ministry, the preaching ministry. And so I want to uh, uncover a huge plot of the enemy to silence half the body of Christ with two scriptures of the Bible. Mm. Two scriptures of the New Testament the enemy has used that is taught improperly, it's out of context, and to shut down half the body of Christ. And so today we're going to uncover his plot. And so I believe there's going to be a lot of freedom today for the ladies out there. So okay. I want to talk about the first lie the enemy would love to tell the women is that women can't speak in church. That means that you're not to teach, you're not to preach, you're going to have to be totally silent in the church. Mm -hmm. And where you get that is one verse in 1 Corinthians 14, look at verse 34, and we're going to delve into this, and we're going to see what does it say and what, does it don't, what is it not saying. So 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, let your women keep silent in the churches. Well, right here, Pastor, it says it. Let your women keep silent in the churches, women can't speak in church. Well, hold on. Let's, let's read the entire verse, and then we're going to actually look in context with the verse after it. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 says, Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law says. And so, to interpret scriptures, you need to make sure that you define major words, and define them from the original languages to understand what they really mean. And second of all, is you need to take Scripture in context. What does that mean? That you need to look at the verses in front of it and the verses after it. Oftentimes, if you just take a Scripture and rip it right out of context, you're going to twist it into something it didn't say. This is what's been happening with two verses in the New Testament. It's been taken, lifted off, and taken out of context. And if we just see what it says actually in context, then you go, oh, I know what was going on. I see that. And it's not what was being portrayed. So first of all, let's look at this word women. So let's go read that verse again. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, let your women keep silent in the churches for they're not permitted to speak, but are to be submissive as the law says. So let's define the word women. Okay, I hear you out there. No, I'm not going to define what a woman is. Uh, <laughs> I think we all know what a woman is. I think there's some, some people are confused about that, but most of us know what a woman is. I'm, that's not what I'm going to talk about. What I want to look at is look at the word women and the Greek word it came from. And so I want to see what that is. So the Greek word translated women here is gune, G-U-N-E. And something very interesting, you need to know something. In the Greek, there's only one Greek word for woman and wife. And actually, you're going to have to look at the context to see which one is it talking about. Is it talking about a woman in general, a female, or is it talking about a wife? And we're going to see in the two verses that the devil has used that generally women are not to be able to minister or teach or, ha or teach men in of case. That's not talking about women in general. It's talking about really the marital relationship. 
And so I want you to see that. So that's kind of where we're going. So I want to look at this first slide. And can if you pop it up, I want to look at 1 Corinthians 14, 34. But let's look at verse 35. And let's look at this in context. It says, let your women, women, gune, keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive, as the law says. So you see the Greek word gune, translated wife many times in the New Testament, a woman in the, in the New Testament. So how do we know which one? And so is there a way to find out which one it is speaking to? Absolutely yes. So let's first of all, there's some clues in the verses that tells us it's speaking about wives, not women in general. Let your women gune keep silent in the churches, for they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive, as the law says. Let's look at those words submissive or to be submissive. Let me say something. Who are women to be submissive to? Their husbands. To husbands. That's right. Women are not to be submissive to all men in general. Mm -hmm. So not all men are over in authority over all women. Mm -hmm. And so, no, a, a wife is to be submitted to her husband. So right here we know we're talking about a wife, not a woman in general. It says, as the law says. And that's what the law says, is for a wife to be submitted to a husband. Look at verse 35. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands. That Greek word is a nair. It's very interesting to know that in the Greek, there's only one word for husband, and there's one word for man. It's the same Greek word, a nair. A-N-E-E-R. Now there's a general word for mankind that's anthropos where we get anthropology. But for a specific man and for a husband, it's one Greek word. You actually have to see in context which one is it talking about. Mm -hmm. Well, right now we know that we're talking about submission and authority. So that's husband and wife. Look at verse 35. It says, if they want to learn something, let them ask their husbands at home. For it's shameful for women to be speaking the church. So if you take this in context, it's talking about the husband-wife relationship. Actually, there's two other verses in the New Testament that gives us ground to translate gune as wives when it talks about submission. I want you to see Ephesians 5.22 where this is actually translated correctly. Ephesians 5.22, like second slide there, it says wives gune. Do you see that? Same one translated women in 1 Corinthians 14. Wives, submit to your own husbands, a nair, as unto the Lord. Mm. Next slide. 1 Peter 3, 1 says, wives, gune. Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, a nair, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives, gune. And so, mysteriously, mm -hmm. we find that it's properly translated in Ephesians 5. It's properly translated in 1 Peter 3 as wives. But for some reason, the translators pick this verse in 1 Corinthians 14 to make it generally women, all women to all men. Mm -hmm. And so, I think really what happened is the translators looked at this and said, you know what, we've translated this as wives and it probably should be. But you know what, I think this is good for all women. It's not good to have the women talking in church or ministering or leading. So let's just put translate it women. And we've done a disservice. They did a huge disservice on this. And so again, that's the context of 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 a husband and wife. So let's let's we can translate 1 Corinthians 14, 34 and 35 as let your wives keep silent in the churches for they're not permitted to speak, but they're to be submissive as the law says, if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it's shameful for the wives to speak in church. So what's really going on here? What was happening? For centuries for, for millennia before, women were not re trained religiously. Mm -hmm. They were not allowed to come to the same church service and sit in the church service in the synagogues with the men. Matter of fact, they had a separate court outside where the men met called the Court of Women. Now, they met there for prayer, but they weren't allowed inside to hear the instruction religious training. So they were not trained in the things of God, but they were getting saved. Mm -hmm. When Jesus died, He elevated women greatly. Yes. And so when a woman got saved, realized, you know what? I'm equal to a man in Christ Jesus. I'm the righteousness of God. That's right. Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And so for the first time you have men and women, wives and husbands, sitting in the church service mm -hmm. together, hearing the Word of God. And, and the ministers ministering the Word of God and the women are not knowing what he's saying. They weren't trained in the Old Testament and the things and the concepts. So they would, right in the middle of the service, they would be asking their husbands, now what is he talking about? Yeah. Explain that to me. Have you ever been in a church service where people are talking? Yes. Is it irritating? Absolutely. I'm a pastor. It irritates me. <laughs> and so it's irritating. And so really what this whole thing is, is don't disrupt the church service with the wives trying to have their husbands teach them 
more about what's being said. And so that's really the only thing that's being said here. Okay. But, but it's been translated wrongly. It's been lifted out of context and it holding women in bondage yeah. from every ministry. Let me tell you something. If a woman is up ministering, everybody ought to be quiet. We need to be silent in our churches. So if you love to talk in the back row at church, stop it. That's right. It's not blessing somebody. So stop talking. And so this is talking about how to have a church service in a way that it's not going to cause disru disru disruption. So that was really what was happening here in this verse. So let's look at the, the next verse, that women can, cannot teach men. That is a lie that's been taught for so many years, so many centuries. And I want you to look at the verse that it's pulled from, 1 Timothy 2.12. It says, I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Well, pastor, it says it right there. It says, I don't permit a woman to teach a man or have authority over a man. But again, I want you to look at define the terms and look at context, the verse above and the verse below, and let's see what it's saying. So let's look at the word woman here. It's the word gune. It could either be woman or wife. You have to look at the context. Next of all, the man is a nair, just translated before as husband multiple times. And so you need which context it is. So can we find out by context, by looking at a verse before verse 12 and a verse after verse 12 and see what it's being said? Can we know if it's wives or it's just women? Absolutely, yes. So I want you to look at the context here. And so go to slide four and let's read the verse above verse 12 and the verse after verse 12. It says, let a woman, gune, learn in silence with all submission that's brought up again. So who are women to be submitted to? Their own husband. Mm -hmm. All women aren't submitting to submission to all men. And so this is talking about the marital relationship, the husband-wife relationship here. So let the woman, should be translated wife, learn in silence with all submission. It says, I don't permit a woman, gune, to teach or have authority over the man, a nair. But it's somehow the translators say, you know what? Let's just translate this woman and man in general instead of husband, wife, even though they have no right to do so. And then look at verse 13. How do we know this is the marital relationship? He uses the example of the first married couple. Look, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. They were the first marriage, first couple of marriage. And so uh, if this is translated rightly because of all submission, we know that's wife. So let's translate this correctly. Let a wife learn in all silence with all submission. I don't permit a wife to teach or to have authority over a husband, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And so what was happening in this verse? Well, in 1 Corinthians 14, what was happening is the wife was interrupting the church service to try to get teaching from the husband about what's being said, we have the opposite going on here. Now we have the, 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 the woman, the wife actually hearing the pastor teach and she reaches over, Fred, you need to be doing this. <laughs> this thing you're not doing. You need to be doing this. And, and, you know, there's nothing. and so she's <laughs> trying to teach him and trying to take authority over using the word against him, interrupting the church service. Again, this is really a, a disruption in the church service. Mm -hmm. And so a husband and wife, a wife is not to usurp authority over her husband and be respectful to her right. husband. And so again, this has nothing to do about women in general, not being able to speak or teach to men in general. So again, take scriptures in context. If you don't take scriptures in context, you take a scripture out of context, you're left with a con. Mm -hmm. And so often the body of Christ has been conned for years mm -hmm. and have shut down half the body of Christ from being able to minister and be qualified to minister. And it's a shame. So mm -hmm. we're making some sacred cow steaks yeah, we are. tonight. So <laughs> move. All right. So let's talk about women speaking in church. Well, if that's the case, women can't speak in church. Well, why is 1 Corinthians 11, 5 talk about women prophesying in church? Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, you can't prophesy with your mouth shut. <laughs> right. So look at 1 Corinthians 11, 5. This is talking about decorum in the local church service. 1 Corinthians 11, 5 says, let every woman who prays, that's gune, you could translate it as wife, but, but it could be translated woman, but every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head for that one and the same as if her head was shaved. So first of all, they were, women were allowed to prophesy in the church service. So, so what, what happened to keep silent in the church? 
Well, what was about the head coverings? What was that about? That was a head covering that women wore in public, especially in the church service, to show her respect to her husband. Yeah. And so that was a custom of the day. Mm -hmm. Paul actually is going to call it a custom. And customs come, but customs go, but right. the principle of authority to your husband will always be the same. Right. So I want you to see in 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen, there were some arguing, some women saying, well, we don't need to wear, we're free. You know, we, we're, we're equal with men, so we don't need to wear the head coverings, and we don't need to submit to our husbands. And so, no, that's, you're, you're taking it too far there. Mm -hmm. And so 1 Corinthians eleven sixteen it says, but if anyone seems to be contentious about head coverings, we have no such custom nor do the churches of God. We don't have any other custom but the head coverings. We don't have any custom where you just women are to, to flaunt this and just take it off. And so we called it a custom. Customs come for a time, but they leave. But what it is is that a wife is supposed to be in submission. So again, let's bring out the fact that these two verses do not prohibit women from teaching in the church service or even teaching with men in the church service. Yeah. But I think it's important to understand that if you're married as a woman, you need to be in submission with your husband. Mm -hmm. Have him as your covering when you're ministering. Mm -hmm. And so as long as your husband has that covering, that's fine. And so that's good. Let's talk about women not being able to teach men. Let's blow that out of the water. Mm -hmm. Let, from the Word of God, look at Acts 18. Look at verse 24. We're going to look at a man named Apollos. And he was eloquent in the scriptures. So let's read Acts 18, 24. It says, Now a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, was an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Look at verse 26. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla, a married couple, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they, did you see the word they? It didn't say Aquila. It says Aquila and Priscilla, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. <gasps> you have a woman teaching a man <laughs> the word right here. It said they explained to him. She was involved in the teaching of Apollos. And so I want you to look at Romans 16, 3, you know, two times that when Priscilla and Aquila is mentioned, actually there's multiple times that Paul will mention this couple. They were a super help to him, one of the key leaders for him. But two times Paul's actually going to mention Priscilla before Aquila. Look in Romans 16, 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. She took the forefront in the work. So, and then in Acts 18, 18, Priscilla is mentioned again before Aquila. But look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19. What did they do in the ministry? What was the work that they did? Look at 1 Corinthians 16, 19. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you hardly in the Lord with the church that is in their house. They pastored a church. Both of them pastored a church. And so, and we know that she was involved in teaching. And so let's talk about women in leadership, that women cannot be in leadership. Oftentimes it says women can teach, but only women's ministry. Mm -hmm. You can teach the women or you can teach the children, but if there's a man in there, shut down. You can't, you can share, but don't get into teaching or preaching. And so let's look about women in leadership. There was even women in leadership in the Old Testament right. where the women were not in the same status, according to men. Look in Judges 4.4. Let's look at the judges that God lifted up and ordained and anointed to lead the nation of Israel. It says, Judges 4.4 4 says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of, of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at the time. She was a judge of Israel. She led the entire nation of men and women, was a leader of the nation of Israel. And God raised her up and God anointed her. She was a prophetess. And so God raised her up not only to be a prophetess, but to be a judge. But let's go into the New Testament. Let's look at women in leadership in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Phoebe. Let's look at the Amplified in Romans 16. Look at verse 1. I'm going to read the Amplified version. Paul says, Now I introduce and commend to you our sister Phoebe, a deaconess. Deaconess was a, an office in the, in the body. There's deacons and the deaconesses. Mm -hmm. And so a woman was a female deacon at the church of Sincrea, verse 2, that they may receive her in the Lord with love and hospitality as God's people ought to receive one another and that you may help her in whatever matter she requires your assistance. She has been my helper of many, including myself. She was at such a level, she told this entire church, if she needs anything, you're to do it. That's, good. That's a strong leadership position for her to be taking. Let's talk about women preaching, preaching. 
Do you know that the first preachers of the gospel were women? Huh? Preachers? Preachers. And they actually, they actually preached to men. Mm. I want you to look at the woman at the, uh, at the well of Samaria. Let's look in John 4, look at verse 28. Jesus basically talks to her and reads her mail. You know what? The, the husband you have now is not your husband. You've had five other, you've, you've had multiple marriages. She goes, I think you're a prophet. <laughs> and so she left her water pot in verse 28. The woman left her water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that ever I did. Could this be the Christ? And so she talked to him about these men about Jesus. And every one of them were interested to hear about everything that, that, she, you ever did? Well, is my name mentioned? <laughs> so they all were interested to hear what, what was said. Look at John 4, 42, though. The men said this. Then they said to the woman, now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him and we know that this indeed is the Christ, the Savior of the world. And so it says we believe not only because of what you said, but now we heard him personally. They came to Jesus because of her. She preached the gospel. Amen. You know, the first women after Jesus was raised from the dead, the very first evangelists were women. Mm -hmm. Look at Matthew 28, look at verse 5. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he's risen. And he said, Come, see the place where the Lord lay, and go quickly. Tell his disciple that he's been risen from the dead. That's the gospel. Jesus died. Obviously, they knew he died, but he raised again from the dead. That's the gospel. Yeah. Go tell his men. Go tell these unbelieving men about the gospel. These women were the first heralds of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And indeed, he was going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, said, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid, but go tell my brethren. Go tell these men the good news of the gospel and to go to Galilee where they'll see me. So again, the women were the first to preach the gospel. Matter of fact, I'm going to see in the Old Testament, it's prophesied that there's going to be a great host of women preaching mm -hmm. in the New Testament. Look in uh, Psalm 68, look at verse 11. This is prophesied in the day we live, there'll be many women preaching. Psalm 68, look at verse 11. And the Lord gave the word, great was the company of those who proclaimed it. Well, Pastor, how do you know that that's women? Because the Hebrew word is feminine. Look in the Amplified in Psalm 68, 11. This is the Amplified. The Lord gives the command, the women who proclaim the good news are a great host of an army. And so they're a great host. And so the women that will bear and publish the good news, and that's the gospel. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you a question. So women can preach but not teach? Women can preach to men but not teach? I don't think so. So let's talk about women in Christ, being in Christ. In the natural home setting, God has designed it that the husband be the head of the home, the natural home. Mm -hmm. And so in any place, a workplace, in the home, anywhere you go, there's submission and authority for it to operate. And so in a home to operate correctly, the husband is the head and the wife is to submit under his leadership as unto the Lord. And so that's the natural, that's the natural relationship. So the man, the husband is the natural head of the woman naturally. But let me talk to you when they got saved, when you get saved as a woman, your head is no longer a man, but Jesus. Jesus is your spiritual head. Natural, your natural head is your husband. Marriage is only a natural relationship until death. Jesus said in the, in the resurrection, when you come, there's neither marriage or, or given in marriage. And so marriage is a flesh covenant. Two will be one flesh. Mm -hmm. And so it's a natural arrangement in the home. But you don't have to go to your husband to pray for you. No, you can go straight into the throne of God and pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ is the woman's spiritual head as a believer. And so you need to know that. And in Christ, there's neither male nor female. I want you to see this verse in uh, Galatians 3. Look at verse 28. Galatians 3, 28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. We understand that. Mm hmm that the all distinction of, of, of your uh, religion, Jewish or Greek, that's removed when you come to Jesus and that's you right. receive His grace. All those things that separate religion, it's all one religious Jesus. Mm -hmm. There is neither slave nor free. 
So it doesn't matter if that you're a natural slave or you're free in the natural or you're an employee or an employer. When an employer and an employee come to church, guess what? They're both equal at the foot of the cross. Right. They, they, you, just, you take off your, your authority hat and you, you're submitted unto the Lord and you're worshiping with whoever next to you. Amen. And so, but next of all, it says there's neither male nor female. What does it mean? The distinction in Christ Jesus ends mm -hmm. that there's male that's, uh, that's higher class and females are lower class. No, no, we're all equal in Christ Jesus. Neither male nor female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. This means there's no distinction in the division in the body of Christ between men and women. So, you know, when we look at the gifts of the Spirit, no verses talk about, you know, women can operate in the word of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Only men can work in the, in the word of knowledge and, and, and the working of miracles. Women, you can't, you can't be used in any of the gifts of the Spirit. No, all the gifts of the Spirit are open for everyone. Amen. We see that. Male, female, we both can have the gifts of the Spirit. So why are we shutting down the offices and functions of ministries? Yeah. But so for some reason we make a distinction of ministries and offices in the body of Christ. Only men can hold that office. Only men can be in that type of ministry. And so let me say this, the church is in Christ. There's neither male nor female in Christ. The church is in Christ. Amen. What pertains to the church is in Christ. The various gifts of the Spirit are in Christ. Amen. The anointings of God are in Christ. The offices are in Christ. There's no gender distinctions in Christ Jesus. There are many women today, just looking at that, I wanted to start with the Word. Mm -hmm. but I just want to look at what we're seeing around us today. Mm -hmm. And so, are you really going to tell me, you want to look at me and, and honestly tell me that Joyce Meyer is not anointed to teach? Uh, yeah, I wouldn't do that. Because <laughs> the anointing is right. tangible on her ministry right. for years and the decade, and people have been set free, their lives yeah. changed, men and women changed by the ministry of Joyce Meyer. Mm -hmm. Are you going to tell me that Carrie Pickett is not anointed. Mm. No, she's extremely anointed and, and ministers here at Karis Bible College. People's lives are being changed. She's on, I think they're going to have a new broadcast with her coming yeah. on there. And she's just an anointed woman of God. Are you going to tell me that Audrey Mack, mm. that just preached last night and healing is here under a strong anointing and then flowed in the gifts of the Spirit yes. and saw many signs, miracles, wonders, and healings of men? A lot of men up there being totally healed by the power of God being ministered through Audrey Mack. See, <laughs> give me a flying break. What about, we keep going. What about, uh, yeah. about Carly Terradez? So we have three women ministering in the healing is here right now. We have Audrey Mack. We have Carly, we have Carly Terradez. We have uh, Carrie Pickett. But it goes on and on and on. Just from my own experiences, I've seen women pastors. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah, I've seen women pastors. There's a wonderful woman pastor, Sandy Kennedy in Kansas. She's a part of our army. Does a wonderful job, has a wonderful thriving church. Her husband is the administrator. She's the pastor. She teaches. Yeah. And she has a wonderful pastor. I was in Belize on our mission trip when we went to Belize. And you know, many pastors down there are women. Mm -hmm. Thriving churches, anointed yes. that are leading. And so why, why are we trying to eliminate mm. certain segments of the body of Christ or half the body of Christ because yeah. it's the enemy's plan. And he's used two verses, two single verses taken out of context. Let me say something to you. The more important the doctrine is, the more verses you'll find to back it up. Mm. And so again, take scriptures into context. And so I'm just really speaking to someone out. I'm speaking to a lady out there or more that you feel called to teach. Mm -hmm. You're called to preach. And you have that calling on you and you've stepped out in it, but there's something in the back of your mind. Yeah, but what about these verses? I don't want to, this is what it says. It seems like this is what it says. And I don't want to go against the word. And so you're, you're kind of limited. You're, you're not as, you're kind of hesitant. You're not mm -hmm. stepping in to the anointing. You're not leaning into his grace in full boldness to stand under the anointing God's put on you. And the Lord says, I'm freeing you. Mm. I'm freeing you from that bondage, from the shackles of wrong, of wrong teaching and religion, and I'm loosing you. I'm loosing you, woman. Loose. Be loosed and go free. Speak my word, says the Lord. Speak it in bolding, and my anointing on you will set people free. Men, women, children will be set free under the anointing, under your ministry. And so God has called all of the body of Christ Amen. to operate in the power of God. All the anointings, all of the offices in the body are available for both. And so let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for those women out there that, that has questioned and, and these two verses have held them back. 
and lacked the, uh, they've been lacking the confidence to step out. Lord, I thank you today they realize that it's been taken out of context. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that they're going to step into the anointing. They're going to, they're going to own that anointing mm. and confidence. And they're not going to be any inferior to a man. That's right. At, at all. Mm. And that they can be used just as powerfully. And Lord, I, we re I release them in the name of Jesus into this grace, into this calling, into this ministry, and it will bear fruit. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Wow, Pastor Rick, what a powerful ministry time. I believe just like you said that there are women out there who are receiving this and it is freeing them up from the lies of the enemy. Yeah. And I love what you said is be free. And I love that you said lean into his grace with full boldness. Amen. That was powerful. I also have to say I love too your little phrase of if you take the con if you take the text out of context, you're left with a con. Yeah. Right? I love that, man. Dig into the word and read it in context. And that's powerful. So we have some questions for you today, if you're ready. Yeah. And so um, I'm excited to share our first one comes from Samaya on YouTube. Samaya is one of our regulars. Basically. You are faithful. <laughs> so Samaya asked this question. There are a lot of men who are anti-women preachers. So what should my approach be as a woman minister to these types of men? And how can I get them to both receive and respect my ministry? Amen. It's not your job to try to argue with them. Mm -hmm. It's not your job to try to defend yourself or defend yeah. what God's called you to do. You know, the best thing you can do is stand up and do it. Amen. You know, the proof is in the pudding. The, fruit, the proof is in the fruit. You know, you look at Joyce Myers and people are, well, women can't teach, but then you see the fruit and the anointing on her life and you see the people's lives set free and it's right there living proof before them that I must be wrong. I'm not understanding something because mm -hmm. I'm seeing it. And so instead of trying to defend yourself, just stand up. Don't apologize. Well, I'm a, I know I'm a woman and, you know, and I, no, no, just stand up. God's called you. God's anointed you. And, and, and it's under his anointing anyway. It's, it's the Holy Spirit that really does the work anyway. And so you just stand up in the anointing, stand up in the authority God's called you Amen. and minister. And, and your fruit will, will speak more than you ever are trying to argue with people. Amen. That's good. Your fruit will speak. Amen. That's right. So our next question uh, is actually coming from Paris on Facebook. And so Paris asked the question, what does it mean for your husband to be your covering? Yeah, actually authority has been given so that the people underneath can be blessed. That's the whole reason. Authority is, is a channel for God's blessing to flow through. Mm -hmm. So authority is can seen as like a channel. And so God's blessing, power, and goodness flows through channels of authority. And so what's below is submission is a place of receptacle. It's a place of receiving the blessing, the peace. And, and, and so really the authority is also a covering Amen. to where you're protected. Right. Who doesn't want to be protected and blessed and covered and, and, and safe? Yeah. And so that's really what God's given authority. But man has used authority wrong and twisted it, tried to oppress people below. But that's never when God's passing or never God's plan. And so the place of submission is all, and that can be in a workplace, that can be in, in, a, in an office place. But when you are in a place of submission, you submit and find the place God's called you to be. That's where you're covered. That's where you're protected. That's where you're safe. And that's where you're going to be blessed. And so again, authority and submission is found everywhere. So wherever you go, find the place of submission to that authority and you're going to end up being blessed, protected. Mm -hmm. And so whenever I've worked, any offices I've worked, I've always asked the, the authority before I do something, is this what you're wanting? Yeah. And so when something goes wrong, I've been protected. Right. But I have to do, if I go rogue and just do whatever I want to do, you're out there, right? Mm -hmm. And the enemy can hit you and attack you. So the Lord wants a wife to be submitted to the husband to be protected, mm -hmm. to be covered to be blessed. Amen. And so that's why he created it. Amen. No, that's really good. So my next question actually kind of comes on the cusp of what you were just answering. So this one comes from a guest on Facebook. And so they're asking, um, does the woman submitting to her husband's teaching outweigh under, the understanding of the word? So I think what the question is, is if she's submitting to her husband and what he's asking of her is not in agreement with the word, is she still supposed to submit in those? Or what is that definition yeah. of submission? And Ephesians says, let the wives submit unto, to her husband as unto the Lord. Amen. And so if, if it's something that's against what the Lord has in his word, then a sin or to do something wrong, then you're to submit unto the Lord because he's yeah. the spiritual head. That's right. He's yeah. out of line. And so if he's asking you to commit a sin, to do something against the word of God. But I think a lot of times submission is really found when there's disagreement. Yeah. 
Yeah, There's a difference between agreement and submission. Agreement means I agree with you. Submission is I have an opportunity uh, where we disagree, but I have the opportunity to submit. Right. And so oftentimes it's just a, a, a different opinion. It's not asking you to do something wrong. But again, if your husband's asking you to do something against the Word of God, then he's out of line and you are to submit unto the Lord. And it's the same thing as any Christian. If the government asks you to sin, ask you to accept something that's totally against the Word of God, homosexuality and mm -hmm. some of the junk that's coming across and causing and telling you to have to submit to that, then no, we have the right to stand up and say, no, I'm submitting to God. And they did that in the early church mm -hmm. when they said, don't preach in Jesus' name. You can't do it. They said, well, Jesus told us to go into all the world and preach the gospel. That's right. So you're, Jesus told me to do it and you told me not to do it. Well, I'm going to submit to God and not you. That's right. And so there was some disobedience, but there's consequences to disobedience. Mm -hmm. you have, mm -hmm. If you're going to do it, be prepared for any consequences. But again, uh, just because a husband tells you to do something that's against the word doesn't mean you have to bow down to that or submit to abuse, physical, emotional, whatever. That's not what he's talking about. And so again, the place of submission is a place of safety, Amen. a safe, a blessing. And so as a husband, husbands out there, it's, it's, a great, it's a great responsibility God's given you and your authority to bless those who are under you, to protect those under you, and to care for them. And so again, I think the devil's try to twist every good thing God's ever made. That's right. Yep. Man, oh, that's powerful. I mean, I thank you for taking the time to define that. I know we probably had many viewers as well wondering on that question of submission to your spouse. So I think that's beautiful the way that you defined submitting it as unto the Word of God. And that's what Scripture tells us. Amen. Yeah. So our next question it comes from Kim on YouTube. So Kim is asking the question, as far as deacons and elders, why are the qualifications listed out for men only? Are women not allowed to be deacons or elders in the church? Well, we just saw that women are called to be deacons because she was called a deaconess. That's right. And so men are called deacons, women are called deaconesses. And so there are elders that are men and there's elders that are women. And so it's different in the Greek. Now, be honest with you, in the early church, most of those called in leadership were men. And so I don't know, it was because of the traditions of the day versus the actual calling of God. But we do have women and men. And actually in 1 Timothy, it talks about qualifications for, uh, for deaconesses and, and, and not to be double-tongued, not to be slanderers and stuff like that. Yeah. And so there are that. And so, uh, but as for, for leadership, uh, more than not have been men, but uh, I, I think probably more are, are ordained by God to probably be in those leadership positions, but that doesn't mean at all that women can't. Yeah. And so again, uh, there are qualifications found in the Word of God for both men and women. Uh, there's there's uh, elder women and old elder men talked about that, and so how they should live their lives, that's in Titus chapter 3. Mm -hmm. And so yeah, so there's different levels of maturity there. Yeah, that's really good. Yep. Amen. So we have another question yep. for you. So this question comes from, let me find it real quick here. Uh, this one comes from Gail on Facebook. And so Gail's question is, um, much of the church is divided on this subject because they're not searching out the scriptures or maybe being led by the spirit. So the question is, is how do I begin to bring a change into my church to understand this truth about women being empowered to be ministers? Right. So if your pastor has a, has a teaching that women cannot teach uh, in the church service to men, well, it's wrong for you to go crosswise and to say, well, you're wrong and, and, start, and try to tell everybody else in the church that he's wrong. That's sowing discord. It's right. calling strife. Yeah. We're never called to go strife. But I think it's an example, just being who you are. Mm -hmm. And so take a class, let them see that fruit in you. That's good. And so, but you know what? Are you called to be at that church? Mm -hmm. And so pray about that. You may be called to be at that church. He may call you to a different church to where there's more opportunity to be able to, for that teaching gift to reach out, not only to women or children, but also to the men. And so again, never so strife, never go contrived. You, if you might end up giving a teaching, maybe even send them the YouTube link and say, hey, what do you think about this teaching? He may come back and say, oh, he's off, he's wrong. And, no, and that's fine, but you've sown that seed. So don't, don't uh, oppose what he's saying, especially don't so strife and teach contrary to what the pastor's teaching. Yeah, so I think it's important. Really 
No, that's excellent. I love that. Don't stro sow the strife. I love that. Yep. But I love that. Stand on the word that you know. Um, so I have another question for you. Mm -hmm. This one actually comes from three different of our viewers. And so I'm going to kind of put it together into one. But this comes from Trina on chat. Um, it also comes from Carly on chat as well as uh, Cindy on Facebook. So they're all asking the same question. But they're asking that, do you believe that women, whether married or unmarried, um, can be bishops or pastors in the church and can they teach leaders? I know you've actually addressed that earlier in your teaching, but since I had three questions on, I thought maybe if you want to recap on that. Yeah, like we said that all of the anointings, gifting and offices are in Christ and in Christ there's neither male nor female. And so the only two verses that have kept women out of the pulpit is the two verses we talked about in 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. We have those two verses and they're taken out of context. So it's really talking about the marriage relationship inside the church service and not disrupting the church service and having a harmonious relationship in your marriage in the church service. And so again, it's been taken way out of context. And so again, uh, there are many powerful pastors that are pastoring today. And so I just named a few, but you know, there's one Marie Helen in yes. France, mm -hmm. minister, been a pastor for years, has a tremendous work in France. And so again, uh, you can't argue with the anointing. You can't argue with the fruit that's on their lives. And so you say, well, yeah, but what about the Word? Well, we just talked about the Word. And the only two verses that anybody could pull to try to say that they can't do what they're doing is those two verses that have been taken out of context. So hopefully it's helped tonight yeah. uh, seeing it in proper Amen. context. Amen. No, yeah. I think that's such a powerful way to end it. And I love to how you answered that as well, that man, you, you know, when God has put the anointing and the call in your life, you gave a great uh, biblical basis for why women are called into pulpit ministry. And so I love that. Submit it, right? Be submitted to your husband. If you're married, be submitted to the elders, the leaders God's yeah. placed over you. Walk that out. But praise God, women, we are empowered. Amen? Amen. And we have beautiful examples in front of us. You shared today with Audrey Matt, Carrie Pickett, and then with Carl Carly Terry does we have some amazing women in front of us just blazing the way that he's raising up a whole host that will preach the gospel. That's right. That will preach and teach. And so are you one of those hosts? Are you one of those great company? Well, don't let anything hold you back. Amen. Take the take the authority God's given you, step in and lean into the anointing, and then you just you just preach and teach and let the power of God operate through you and let that defend you. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Rick, so much for your Absolutely. teaching today. It was powerful. I'm excited to share this out as well with other friends and family. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, our live stream audience, for joining us today. And thank you for your questions. You've asked some great ones. So again, we just want to thank you so much for joining us today and let you know that you can join us tomorrow, Friday at 10 a.m. for Karis Daily Live Bible Study. It's 10 a.m. Mountain Time. But thank you again so much for joining us and have have a blessed weekend. Amen. If we understand how much God loves us, then healing becomes so easy to receive. You've got the same power on the inside of you that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We fight the fight of faith from a place of victory. Your life is about to change. Welcome to a new normal. Did you know the first step in finding God's will is knowing that God has a specific plan for your life? Abba Father is the one that knows where you came from. He knows why you're here. He knows who you are. And He knows where you're going. And He knows how to get you there. You'll be surprised to see what God can do for you. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.